Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, very glad to have you join us here uh, for the latest installment in our Earth Week programming. Uh, my name is Dan. I am the Director of Development and Programming for the Bedford Playhouse. I want to thank you for taking your, some time out of your day today. Happy Earth Day um, for what I'm sure is going to be a really great, great presentation. Uh, a couple of things very quickly before I introduce uh, our special guest for the evening. Um, to ask a question, which you can do at any time during the presentation, uh, there is a Q&A button, which is located at the bottom of your screen on your laptop or PC. It's at the top of your screen on your iPad or iPhone. Um, please feel free to post a question. There will be time for questions uh, later on in the program. Uh, I hope all of the students who are tuned in uh, this evening, I know it was an assignment, but I think you'll find it informative. Please don't be shy about asking questions. Uh, the Bedford Playhouse is a 501c3 nonprofit. So as always, uh, we ask that if you enjoy this uh, presentation, if you find it informative, um, please uh, consider visiting our website, bedfordplayhouse.org, uh, and consider making a contribution. We, we cannot do it without the support of the community. Uh, we really appreciate all the help that we get. Uh, any contribution is sincerely appreciated. Um, I should also lastly mention uh, that we are recording this evening, so there will be a recording that will be available that we'll send out to everyone um, for those who might want to revisit all or part of it or share it with anyone that you think might be interested in viewing it. It'll be on our YouTube channel. Um, that link will also come around along with a few other links uh, that are relevant to tonight's talk for, for more information. Uh, so with that being said, let me uh, read the introduction for our very special guest. Um, Dr. Alex Halliday is the director of Columbia University's Earth Institute. He joined the Earth Institute in April 2018 after spending more than a decade at the University of Oxford, during which time he was Dean of Science and Engineering. His scientific achievements have been recognized through numerous awards, including the Murchison Medal of the Geological Society, the Bowen Award and Hess Medal of the American Geophysical Union, the Yuri Medal of the European Association of Geochemistry, the Oxberg Medal of the Institute of Measurement and Control, and a knighthood for services to science and innovation. He is the fellow of the UK's Royal Society and an international member of the US National Academy of Sciences. As a professor in Columbia's Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences, Dr. Halliday divides his time between Columbia's Morningside campus and his geochemistry lab at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. The main focus of his current activities is establishing the new Columbia Climate School. Please uh, welcome to the forum, Dr. Alex Halliday. Hi. Thank How you. are you, sir? Yeah, thank you very much indeed, Dan. Very nice and is yours. Very kind of you, thank you. So um, what I'd like to do is to um, talk with you today about the um, the whole history of the earth in half an hour and just quickly give you a, a sense of context for how the earth has changed and how much it's changed over its amazing geological history and much of it we've had to, had to piece together with something a field called geochemistry i'm a geochemist uh, where we use techniques you called isotopes to actually make this happen i'm going to share my screen to start the presentation and um, there'll be one or two videos and, and audios. I, they should work okay. If there's any, any hiccups, Dan can interrupt, but I think it'll, it should work okay. So I'm just gonna go to share screen. And there we go. Um, let me put that on full screen. And move myself out of the way. So I hope you can all see that okay. Um, so I want to I want to mainly talk about the overall history of the Earth today and uh, how it's evolved and uh, why um, at the, at the, basically the, the last um, half of the talk is really about the more recent history of the Earth and how in particular it's changing and in particular the human influence and why we need to decarbonize in order to avoid dangerous climate change. So I'm, I'm not gonna have time to talk about every aspect of climate change or the earth system here. Uh, feel free to ask questions uh, afterwards 
Um, and there may be a lot of things that I touch upon that might spark your curiosity um, to do with the evolution of the Earth as well. Feel free to ask questions about that uh, as well going forward. Uh, but I did want to talk about uh, at the end about how we're building the climate school, this new thing. It's the first school that Columbia's had for over 25 years. And it's a major step forward for us in terms of our ways we're thinking of combating climate change and contributing to the effort to decarbonize and transition society. So I want to include that in talking about the recent history of the Earth at the end. But let's start with the beginning. <clears throat> and so um, just to let you know that if you didn't know that we're made of stars, which of course is a Moby song or it's in a Moby song, but the uh, idea that we're made of stars is actually correct. Uh, the carbon, uh, nitrogen, pretty much everything except the hydrogen and helium um, that makes up our solar system came from other stars and was born in other stars. And one of the remarkable things that um, has been discovered over the last 30 odd years is that we've got bits of stardust uh, preserved in meteorites that we have in our museums and they are falling on the earth on a regular basis. Uh, and they're actually the most common kind of meteorite that we have. And these are bits of early solar system debris that include a whole lot of bits of the early solar system, but they also include some of that original stardust that was formed around other stars. So that's another talk I can give you sometime about how the solar system first formed. But these are the kinds of rocks that we're talking about. They're not like normal rocks. They are called chondrites because they've got these strange uh, round things. I don't know whether you can see these things. These round things are called chondrules. They're about a couple of millimeters across, very small, maybe half an inch maximum. Um, so I'm gonna have to switch between American and European here. Uh, and that's why they're called chondrites because they've got these chondrules. They're not rocks that formed like from a volcano or anything like that, or uh, as a normal sediment. They're sort of rubble piles from asteroids. And uh, they're asteroids that never got big enough or hot enough to melt. And so they didn't actually, they represent the early dust of the solar system and junk of the solar system. Um, but it's a remarkable pile of junk because it's got the earliest history of the solar system preserved in it. And one of the most important sets of objects here, apart from those chondrules, are these sort of really grubby looking gray, gnarly looking bits, which actually are called refractory inclusions. There's a bit more of one over there. And these things are how we actually figure out the age of the solar system. This is my lab uh, in, uh, that I had in Oxford, and it shows one of our mass spectrometers that we use for measuring the isotopic compositions of elements. And those isotopes, uh, those of you who are Rhodes Scholars uh, may recognize Rhodes House out the window there. Um, those isotopes tell us about the history of the solar system. And also they tell us about temperature, which I'll come on to uh, later on. So this is what you conclude about the earliest history of the solar system um, and uh, how long we've been around for. This is... Um, these are those really early objects, you know, that this first object down here at the bottom, calcium aluminum refractory inclusions. Um, these are thought to be, we call them pebbles because they're thought to be very small objects that became slightly bigger objects and bigger objects. And this is how we think we eventually built planets from these things sticking together. Uh, and they have ages of, this is a, a uranium lead age, it's been determined, but there are others very similar to this of four and a half billion years. And these are the oldest objects that we know that formed within our own solar system. And we know their age, you can see the error bar there, that's actually less than a million years, four and a half billion years ago. So it's incredibly high, incredibly precise. We know when the solar system started because of those early grubby little objects. Uh, we've also got those chondrules, they've got a range of ages that span a few million years. Um, and then we've got meteorites from Mars, and we can tell from those that Mars formed in a few million years. There are these iron meteorites, which are the most common meteorites that you actually find. Uh, chondrites are the most common ones to fall on Earth, but uh, iron meteorites hang around, whereas the chondrites just fall apart fairly quickly. 
So very often when people come across something strange in a field or a desert or a, an ice sheet, it's an iron meteorite uh, because they, they hang around for longer. Um, and these are actually the metallic cores of early planets. Uh, and these things are, you know, less than a million years old in some cases. Um, they formed incredibly early, the very start of the solar system. So within a million years, we already have planetary objects forming. They were less than 100 kilometers in size, um, but they were and typically maybe the size of New York City or New York State, something like that. They weren't massive planets, but nonetheless, they were um, big enough to, to melt and form met metallic cores, rather like the Earth as a core today, but a very early form of one of those. And we can date those. We can also figure out indirectly the time that Jupiter and Saturn formed, which are giant planets, by using isotopes, which I won't go into the details of it, but it's to do with the energy we know that there was in the early solar system for melting and how it affected some of the uh, icy satellites around some of these objects. And that tells us roughly how much energy there was and therefore when Saturn formed, for example. So that gives you an idea of how quickly the earliest objects formed in our solar system. That's the first roughly five million years of the solar system. Now I wanna show you what happened with the formation of the earth. And here the time scales change quite a lot. So down here, you've got what's happening to earth's neighbors in the bottom. And this time scale is now 250 million years. So we've gone from 8 million years to 250 million years. And this is the early planet formation I just showed you. Uh, there are certain things happening on other planets, like Mars, for example, that we've been able to figure out. But this is the growth of the Earth, which we've been able to deduce. And it's quite gradual by comparison. And in particular, we think that um, the last big chunk of Earth formation, what we call in the giant impact here, which is the last 10% of the mass of the Earth, um, which is when the moon formed, uh, didn't happen till about 60 or 70 million years after the start of the solar system. So it was relatively late. There are one or two things that came along later, uh, which are called the late veneer. Uh, this, is, um, this late veneer is very interesting because it's the reason why we have some gold and platinum in the surface of the earth where we are today. Uh, most of the Earth's platinum and gold should have gone and did go into the Earth's core. If you took the platinum uh, or the amount of gold that's in the Earth's core and made it a layer of gold around the surface of the Earth, it would cover the Earth to a depth of a meter. Um, there's a lot of, um, or three feet, there's a lot of gold and platinum all there in the core of the Earth. But there's a little bit, which is the stuff that we use in our jewelry, etc., which is actually in the silicate part of the earth where we walk around on. And uh, that was probably added in this, what we call this late veneer after the core had formed. That's why it didn't go into the core. And that's why it's so, so really amazing, very interesting thing. And then we've got some things that happened on the moon which are added uh, in down here. Just here, I'll come back to this in a minute. These are the oldest grains that we found on the surface of the earth, uh, the Jack Hill zircons. And they are, they've been dated at 4.35 billion years. So they're roughly 200 million years after the start of the solar system. Uh, these are the oldest um, grains that we found that actually formed on Earth. And that we, we can, much of the early Earth has been destroyed and the surface of the Earth has been destroyed. But this is a bit that we've got that's actually there. Some, some of these grains that formed uh, on the surface of the Earth from, from rocks rather like our continents. So I want to say just a little bit about this uh, moon forming giant impact, because this is actually quite important. It actually, if you want to talk about temperature on the surface of the Earth, this was temperature like no other. The moon forming giant impact uh, was between the Earth when it was only 90% formed and another planet that we call Theia, um, when it was about, it was about 10% of the mass of the Earth or roughly the size of Mars. And we call it Theia because um, I asked my team when I was in Switzerland, who was the mother of Selene, um, the goddess of the moon, because we need to know who gave birth to the moon. And it was this goddess Theia who basically uh, gave birth to Selene. So we basically decided to call the planet Theia. And this is a simulation of what that 
look like that giant collision between these two planets. And it's been done by my colleague, Robin Canop, who um, I'm writing a paper with right now. She and I work on stuff to do with the early solar system when I'm working on those things. And this shows those two planets getting closer, they're hitting each other with a glancing blow. And you can see the energy that's involved in this. This looks like a cartoon or something that may have been done, um, you know, just for, for fun. But actually, it's a very high resolution, powerful supercomputing um, uh, simulation. And it gives us a rough idea of the temperatures involved. And those temperatures are huge. I mean, they're thousands of degrees that the Earth is being heated up to. So you wouldn't have had a water atmosphere or a, um, you, know, a, you know, a steam atmosphere. You would have had a rock atmosphere. You would have vaporized the rocks of the Earth to actually uh, form uh, a sort of super atmosphere, which you have around that glowing planet. It's a bit jerky. I'm not happy, not happy with how slowly it's going. Um, but um, anyway, you get the picture. And anyway, it's from this, the debris that was left going around the Earth that we formed the moon. So that's one of the most interesting areas of discussion these days, exactly how it happened. And why it's important is because we actually think that the moon and that giant impact uh, gave the Earth its spin. Uh, the Earth's moon provides an anchor and stops the a gravitational anchor and stops the Earth from, from wobbling too much. Uh, of course, the, the moon also gives us a tide. It gives us um, the, the tilt, gives us seasons. And we think all of this was actually really important from the point of view of uh, forming life on Earth and for life to actually develop in a habitable way and a stable way. And in particular, we think the tides may have been really important from the point of view of um, at one time, eventually um, getting vertebrates to develop and for amphibians to come out and walk around on land. That's another story again, some other time we'll tell you about that. Um, so let me just get back, that's the moon forming giant impact. I just want to talk quickly about these Jack Hill zircons a little bit more, uh, which formed 200 million years after the start of the solar system. Because this is an example of some of the oldest crust on Earth here. These are four billion year old rocks. There are no rocks you can walk around on that are older than these. They're, so there's, I said the solar system is four and a half billion years old. And the oldest rocks you can walk around on on the continents are four billion years old. So the first 500 million years of the Earth's history at the surface of the Earth is missing. Uh, it's been destroyed. Uh, those, unlike on the moon or Mars, where we've actually got rocks that are um, from the very earliest history of those planetary objects, we don't have that for the Earth. Everything's been decimated and destroyed on the surface of the Earth. But so these four billion year old rocks, uh, what's interesting about them is that the ones these guys are walking around on are actually sedimentary rocks. And they tell us that they were laid down in water. So that means that there was water, uh, liquid water on the surface of the earth by about 4 billion years ago. Um, these grains that I've got here, these Jack Hill zircons, um, which are found in Australia, they've been found in earlier sediments. So they, they're grains that are older, uh, sorry, they're not earlier, they're younger sediments. Uh, but the grains are older. They've basically um, been brought down from erosion from uh, earlier continental rocks. And what's been found is that actually these grains are 4.35 billion years old. So within 200 million years or about 200 million years after the start of um, the solar system. And the isotopes in there, of the oxygen in particular, um, tell us that um, there was liquid water on the surface of the Earth even then. So the Earth cooled down within about 200 million years and there was liquid water. Um, we went from that very hot state to something very cool um, where there was liquid water on the surface of the Earth. So those oxygen isotopes are really important. Uh, it's a technique that was developed by a guy called Harold Urey. Harold Urey um, won the Nobel Prize for discovering deuterium. Uh, he was at the University of Chicago, 
And he uh, also then went on to do all kinds of things about the origin of life. He had all kinds of work he did on the origin of the moon. But one of the most important things he did was to realize that uh, the different isotopes of oxygen, that's, for those of you who don't know, isotopes have the same place in the periodic table. They're all oxygen atoms, but they've got different proportions of neutrons. And because neutrons are neutral, they don't affect the chemical properties at all. But they do affect the mass, and that the proportions of one isotope of oxygen relative to another in a carbonate, say, that's growing from seawater, like, for example, a seashell, growing from seawater, that the proportion of oxygen atoms, the isotopes, um, tells you how cold it was or how warm it was. And this is the key to figuring out the entire temperature history of the Earth and how it's changed over time. Now, I just told you there was liquid water on the surface of the Earth um, uh, in these very, very early times. Uh, what's interesting about that is that the Earth actually should have been frozen. Carl Sagan, uh, who, as you, most of you probably know, was a very famous scientist. He died very early, unfortunately. Um, but he was a, a brilliant scientist and great science communicator. Um, he posed this problem that actually stars, when they start up, it takes them a while to really heat up. And our sun would have taken a while to get to the kind of temperatures where you would have had liquid water on the surface of the Earth. So the sun's energy um, wouldn't have been sufficient for water to form on the earth, except as ice. So on the surface of the earth, we should have actually cooled down even more from that moon forming giant impact. So that's really interesting. And it tells us that it must have been something in the atmosphere that was keeping it warm. And that thing was probably carbon dioxide. It may also have been methane or it may have been both. Uh, but we had what we call greenhouse gases in the very early Earth, and they were essential to keeping it warm. Otherwise, we never would have had liquid water on the surface of the Earth. And of course, greenhouse gases, we talk about a lot today because they keep the planet warm today. Um, and the same is true today. If we didn't have any greenhouse gases at all, water is a greenhouse gas, actually. Uh, but the, these gases basically, at some level, um, provide... Uh, both sustenance for the planet, keep it, keep it habitable, but also they can actually heat it up too much, as we'll talk about in a second. So using these oxygen isotopes, again, don't need to know the details of how we do it. This is a rough idea of how temperature then changed on the surface of the Earth. Uh, between roughly the earliest signs of life, we've got some microfossils that formed about three and a half billion years ago. Uh, and we've got more of those going over, over the history of the, of the Earth um, until about 500 million years ago when suddenly things exploded and we had lots of diverse life forms. Um, we've got estimates of temperature based on oxygen isotopes. And you can see that the temperatures for the various things that we've got, and they're mainly um, uh, um, they're what we call opal, which is uh, like silica. It's, it's kind of like, um, like quartz, but it's not crystalline like quartz. And you get opal in the oceans and you get it opal back through time in some of these rocks. And you can measure the temperature of the surface of the earth from the oxygen isotopes in the opal. And you can also do that with carbonates, as I've already said. And you get temperatures that are actually quite high, much higher than today. Today we've got down here on the right, we've got the present day average surface ocean temperature about 15 degrees. And you can see that back in those days, temperatures were way warmer. And it wasn't until temperatures got much, much cooler and more like they are today that we started to see the explosion of diverse life forms that are actually um, the main invertebrates, the brachiopods, the trilobites, the bivalves, um, as well as vertebrates starting to develop around that time. So I'm now gonna quickly whiz through the rest of the history of the Earth and just give you some idea of just how much temperature has changed on the surface of the Earth. Of course, not like the thousands of degrees of the moon forming giant impact, but nonetheless, we've had some big temperature swings even in the last 500 million years. Again, not as much as we had, you know, in those very early life, when there were those very early life forms, um, 
but we've had temperatures of about swings of about 10 degrees uh, or more over that period. And this shows you the last 500 million years. You can see the temperatures went up dramatically. And at times they were more than 10 degrees warmer than today. At other times they were much lower. And, um, uh, and that gives you some kind of a, a rough idea of, of how things have changed over time. This time at the end here, uh, about 65 million years ago is when the dinosaurs went extinct at the end of what we call the Cretaceous. And we get into a period called the Cenozoic shown in green here. So we're looking at this now in more detail on the right. Uh, we call that the KT boundary when the dinosaurs went extinct, extinct. Partway through the bit on the left, we had the whole development of amphibians, life on earth, various kinds of plants, uh, amazing things happening that again are in, you know, at some level related to the formation of the moon. Um, but this bit uh, since 65 million years ago, since the dinosaurs went extinct, uh, when we've had um, a relatively stable surface to the earth, things have been going quite strikingly in the direction of cooler and cooler temperatures. So there are some exceptions that I'll talk about in a second. But what you can see is over these last 65 million years ago, this, this 65 million years, this basically takes you through to about 5 million years ago. Uh, you can see that the temperatures start off incredibly high. Like again, they were about 10 degrees Celsius relative to today. And um, there's a peak here at about 14 degrees, which is thought to be was about 50 million years ago which is thought to be to do with a, uh, the, the oceans got so warm that some very cool methane hydrates, uh, methane deposits, clathrates at the bottom of the ocean uh, erupted. They came to the surface and a ton of methane was added to the atmosphere, which as you know, as I just said, is a, a, greenhouse, um, uh, a greenhouse gas. And so, um, temperatures went even higher during that early Paleoc what we call Paleocene, Eocene thermal maximum. And then things started cooling down. They've been cooling down, getting cooler and cooler. There have been some times when they didn't go up and down, they just went flat. And then they got cooler and cooler and cooler again. And this shows you basically how we then go into this period of the last 5 million years when things are even cooler, that trend continues. And over this time of cooling of the surface of the Earth, things have changed dramatically. So back at the beginning here, 50 million years ago, um, there were no ice sheets on the surface of the earth. Antarctica was barren, wasn't, well, it wasn't barren, it had probably had quite thriving forests on it and there, was, um, there were wild animals rolling around, roaming around the same in the Arctic as well. Uh, and it wasn't until uh, about um, 35 million years ago that things got cold enough that glaciation started in the Antarctic. And we can see the beginning of Antarctic glaciation because of the kinds of deposits that get preserved in sediments around Antarctica, out in the oceans. Of course, there weren't penguins there. I just like that photograph of penguins diving up. And then in the Northern Hemisphere, we started getting Arctic glaciation, Northern Hemisphere glaciation around 3 million years ago. So much, much later, and uh, it's a smaller amount of ice. There's about one tenth of the amount of ice on, uh, in the Arctic as there is in the Antarctic or Greenland as there is in uh, the Antarctic. So Antarctic is the big beast in terms of ice. But nonetheless, this is more of the same trend of cooling down the surface of the earth. Nobody knows what started the ice age, three ice ages in the Northern hemisphere three million years ago. But of course the ice sheets eventually covered the uh, extended right over New York City, for example, and you can see the remains of their movement uh, in Central Park. Uh, so things got cooler and cooler and cooler uh, for quite a while. So these records that I've just shown you are based on using seashells and things like that. Uh, a few years ago, we came up with the most brilliant, more accurate kind of method just for the last several hundred thousand years. And this is from what we call ice cores. So in Antarctica, um, it was decided to drill down through the Antarctic ice sheet uh, more than two miles. And we got down to, we were trying to get down to Lake Vostok, which is down below there. I say we, 
It was the Russians with the Americans and the Brits and a few others who were involved. It was a big team uh, doing this. And in the process, they withdrew this uh, core of ice, which of course is still preserved. It's the Vostok ice core. And we can actually get, the, there are little bubbles, tiny bubbles of air trapped in uh, those, those ices. And we can actually get the air out and we can measure the carbon dioxide concentration, which is remarkable. You can also tell a lot of other things as well. You can tell from the oxygen isotopes in the ice what the temperature was. So you've got this record of how the earth was changing through the ice ages from this amazing glacial interglacial period. I won't go into the details of how we go from glacials into interglacials. It's to do with the way the earth processes um, and, and, uh, and spins. Um, but basically every 100,000 years, we've been going from a glacial environment to an interglacial environment. And this shows you how much carbon dioxide there is in the atmosphere. During glacial times, when the surface of the earth is cooler, carbon dioxide is more soluble in ocean water. So more of the carbon dioxide goes into the ocean and less stays in the atmosphere. Whereas in interglacial times, you get these peaks where you get carbon dioxide concentrations of around 300 parts per million, 280, 290, those kinds of numbers. And that's basically the way things are. And that's the way things should be today. We should be in, in an interglacial today and with a roughly 280 parts per million carbon dioxide. Now, in reality, this is what's happened instead. Um, there's been this massive rise in carbon dioxide. You can see this in the ice core record. You can also, of course, measure it because we've been measuring carbon dioxide concentrations for decades on Mauna Loa in Hawaii and getting direct measurements of carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere. And those two records agree, those records agree with each other perfectly. So we know carbon dioxide is going into the atmosphere at increasing rates. It's uh, an incredible rate. It's far faster than anything naturally, about 10 times faster. And it's um, having a, a major impact on the planet. And we know exactly what's causing it. So this is a blow up of that period. And you can see basically in calendar years here, towards the end of the 1700s, uh, you actually get a significant increase starting in that level of carbon dioxide. And if you know your history, you may know that this is when the Industrial Revolution started. 1769, a Scottish engineer called James Watt patented a new, more efficient kind of steam engine. And this sparked the start of the Industrial Revolution. Of course, there are many other facets to it as well. It had huge impact on society. Of course, it was tremendously positive for people, lifting people out of poverty, creating jobs, creating well-being and many other things, but it also created CO2. And the burning of fossil fuels in particular has been driving that big change in CO2 in the atmosphere. So I just wanna quickly go into now about what this means. And I wanna introduce you to Columbia University's Climate School, which is built on the legacy of some amazing climate scientists at Columbia, uh, in particular, Wally Broker, uh, Wally Broker, this, here he is with Bill Clinton getting the National Medi Medal of Science. Uh, he's one of the, uh, probably the most distinguished climate scientists the world's ever had. Uh, and he was here in New York. And in 1975, he introduced the term global warming into the scientific literature. And I just want you to hear one of the things he said back in 2014. He died a couple of years ago, unfortunately, but this, uh, listen carefully to what he says. I'm not going to use projections. I'm going to try to scare you a bit because I don't think that many people really get it as far as how difficult a problem this is. This is an awesome problem. And, and you know, we have people who don't want to believe it at all, but a lot of people who are aware of it and accept that it is a problem don't really get it as to how serious a problem it is. It's really, really bad. I'm not going to use projections. Oh, sorry. I'm going to try to scare you a bit. Okay, so I just wanted to quickly, I mean, his voice is pretty important because 
he was one of the early people who warned about global warming and the effect that it was going to have on the planet. And he, in his later life, got more and more pessimistic about our ability to deal with this. And so, of course, today is a great day because the Biden administration, but other world leaders as well, are getting together to make a strong pitch for trying to deal with this carbon dioxide problem. So let me just quickly explain to you why we're doing this at Columbia uh, and focusing on this problem. It's not just Wally Broker. Uh, we are top ranked for geosciences. We have close to a thousand faculty, researchers and staff who are working on climate and sustainability. Uh, so we're unusually strong in that particular subject. Uh, and the, the body that I, I direct, the Earth Institute, has over 20 centers, including the Mont Body Earth Observatory, which is shown here on the right, uh, and which runs the Langseth ship, which is one of the global class of vessels. We do a lot of work and we have been working on the oceans for many years, uh, but on geosciences generally. We're also strong in a number of other key disciplines like journalism, uh, energy, uh, engineering, etc. So, um, but we also have a strong connection with NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies. So that's another reason why, uh, which I'll come on to in a second, as to why uh, New York is such a great place to be studying this. The kinds of work we're doing are understanding and modeling the climate, uh, trying to figure out what needs to be done to slow down climate change, and the policy work that needs to be done as well as the technology that needs to be developed. Uh, we're interested in, of course, resilience and adaptation. Uh, and then finally, we're interested in climate communication and how do we change people's ways of thinking. And you may have heard of Tom's Restaurant uh, because of a rather famous TV series. Um, well, you may not know that Tom's Restaurant, this building is actually owned by Columbia University. And on these, in these floors above, is the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies. So the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies was run by this guy, Jim Hansen, and he's still around. He's in the Earth Institute with us in Columbia, uh, but he was a major advisor. He was one of the key advisors to um, the president of the United States on science. And he became aware of the issue of global warming. And today he's a massive advocate for this. He's long been uh, trailblazing in uh, warning people about the worries of global warming. And the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies, which is shown, their, their climate record is shown here. They, along with many others, I could show you the Hadley one from the UK, or I could show you the Berkeley one. They all show the same curve for how temperature is changing. And it's quite dramatic. Uh, it's been going up um, pretty steadily. Uh, with, of course, in detail, there are ups and downs from one year to the other uh, over the last um, 50 years or so, it's been uh, particularly striking going forward. And we have a very good idea how to measure temperature now. All the, all the records, the different groups trying to come up with different estimates, they all agree about it. It's initially quite a difficult thing to do. How do you measure an average temperature for the Earth, uh, surface temperature for the Earth? But we've actually got very, very good data for it today. I just want to show you some of the effects of that. This is, shows you what's happening to Antarctica today in terms of those ice sheets. And this is work going on at Columbia's Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. And it shows you how ice is flowing off the continent. It's actually flowing out into, the, uh, into this area here, into this estuary, and then disappearing out into the oceans. It's melting. And the elevation change is being shown here. The dark, as it gets darker over time, these is, this is changing every year. It's getting darker. That means the elevation is going down. We can measure this with satellites, of course. So we're losing mass of Antarctica into the oceans, and it's very, very dramatic. Uh, a recent study, uh, which was published by a colleague who's in Arizona, uh, sorry, in California, um, uh, Reno et al. 2018, this shows you um, they've come up with estimates for roughly four decades of ice loss in Antar for the Antarctic ice sheet. And this is expressed in gigatons per year. A gigaton is a billion tons of, or a trillion, a trillion kilograms. Um, and roughly speaking, if you want to see what a gigaton is, look down here at this little box. One gigaton is 400,000 Olympic pools. So this has gone up quite dramatically. You can see the numbers here. And this most recent decade, we're looking at 250, um, 
250 gigatons. So we're looking at um, we're looking at 100 million, um, 100 million Olympic pools being lost every year from the surface of the Earth uh, as melting ice into the water. And that, of course, is affecting sea level. And this is also work that we've been very heavily engaged with. Uh, it shows what's happening. You can't, the earth is not a bathtub. It doesn't actually just, the water doesn't just go up and down. If you take ice off the continents, like Antarctica or Greenland, actually the, the land underneath goes up because you're taking the pressure off the surface of the earth. And so sea level in places is going down. So the average sea level change doesn't tell you what's happening in detail. And some places, mainly around the equator, are more at risk than others. And these big red arrows are particularly important, but the yellow ones aren't so great either. And that includes the South and East United States, for example. Uh, if you go back to when we had 400 parts a million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, naturally, which was before the ice ages, three million years ago, average sea level was more than 50 feet higher than today. Uh, many coastal cities would be completely flooded uh, these are some of the cities that are most in danger of sea level change. It's not just the sea level change itself, but what happens during a storm, of course, like Hurricane Sandy, uh, that has a big impact. If Hurricane Sandy hit Mumbai the, uh, in India, the effects would be far worse. But I just wanted to highlight the fact that these top 10 cities in terms of uh, population and vulnerability, um, five of them are south and eastern United States. So we're doing a lot of work in Colombia on trying to understand this. And in particular, um, we've been getting people to think about how do you retreat from coastal areas? Uh, so we did a conference a couple of years ago. It was a knockout. Nobody had ever heard this term managed retreat before. There were more than 50 journalists there out of 300 people there. And we're doing it again this year. Uh, we've of course got to do it virtually. We don't just work on adaptation and these major issues about how we adapt to climate change. We also work on decarbonization. This shows you what we've got to do in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, this is kind of complicated in some ways, don't worry about it. But the key thing to realize is that all these emissions here, the biggest ones are carbon dioxide in terms of their, uh, and, uh, their contribution. Um, the biggest cause of this is energy, which is shown here on the left. And there's a lot of things that you need to decarbonize to make a difference there. And the problem is that um, while we were increasing the proportion of renewables, so this shows you the proportion of renewables and how that's growing over time. You can see renewables becoming more and more important over time. The trouble is the proportion isn't the key thing. Uh, what matters is the denominator, the bit on the bottom, which is the total amount of energy that's being consumed. And as lifestyles improve, people want to, because of they're getting wealthier, healthier, wealthier, living longer, wanting to have more things, want to have their own car, uh, they're consuming more energy. And so the total amount of energy consumption is going up dramatically over time, as you can see on the right. And if you look at the gas, oil, coal, and biomass, it's projected to carry on increasing, despite everything we've been doing with renewables. So this is why we have a massive problem on our hands. All the work we've been talking about to do with climate change, switch to renewables, decarbonizing the planet, we're still putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and the energy mix that we're putting together, even though it's a greater proportion of renewables, isn't enough to offset the fact that there's a bigger energy demand over time. This shows you one of the things we need to do to deal with this because um, this is, greenhouse gas emissions and gigatons of carbon dioxide per year on the y-axis and uh, how that's changing, expected to change over time. If you have business as usual, uh, uh, shown over here and just efficiencies that start to come in. Uh, what happens if you wanna get below two degrees Celsius warming? We've got one degree so far. Uh, what you might, and of course, what we've been told is we need to get below that even further to 1.5 degrees Celsius warming. These options for trying to reduce carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we can't do it just by a switch to renewables. We actually have to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And that's what we call negative carbon dioxide emissions that's shown here. We've got to figure out ways of getting carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and burying it underground. 
And there's a lot of work on this going on. It's going to be a key part of the plans for America and other parts of the world going forward. These are four individuals at Columbia University from different centers, all working and producing work in this particular area on how we actually take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Um, and just very quickly, because we're running out of time, uh, this is actually really important from the point of view of um, real live experiments. The president of Iceland working with Wally Broker and others many years ago, we started this project at the Earth Institute to actually try taking carbon dioxide and putting it into solution in water and getting it into rocks and mineralizing it underground. And actually it works. We find that we can actually get carbon dioxide and store it underground. This was in Bloomberg, Bloomberg today. Iceland startup wants to turn carbon shipped from Europe into rock. They're gonna turn this into a way of getting rid of carbon dioxide and putting it in the ground. Uh, they expect to be able to run about 3 million tons of carbon dioxide, and turn it into rock by 2030. Just to remind you, uh, the numbers I just showed you of how much carbon dioxide we're putting into the atmosphere, it's not 3 million tons a year, it's 50 billion tons of carbon dioxide a year. So this is a small, important step, but it is a small one. We need to do something much bigger. There's also, there are many other examples of this where people are trying to capture the carbon dioxide from the air. This is uh, one in Switzerland, um, but there are several others starting up around the world as well, trying to take carbon out of the atmosphere and then figure out how to put it underground. So just to finish, um, I know I've talked a bit longer than I expected. Uh, I just wanted to summarize that I think there are reasons to be positive. And uh, of course, it takes a lot of political will. But we do have the science and technologies. We do need more. These things are still very expensive to do. We need to make them cheaper. Uh, we need political will. Ultimately, politicians are elected on the basis of how they keep people happy. And so if you're not making people happy, people won't want to reelect you. So political will has to be gained here by talking to people and communicating with them about how important this is. Um, we can mitigate climate change, but it requires not just technology, but also policy and strategy to do that. Uh, I would highlight the role of young people in particular. I think they've had an uh, incredible energizing effect. This is the biggest intergenerational human rights issue that we face. And we have to worry about not how inconvenient things are for us, but what we're gonna be doing to our future generations and their ability to um, live on this planet going forward. So thank you very much. Um, good to talk to you. I'm happy to answer any questions. I'll stop, stop sharing. Okay, great. And then just a reminder, um, anybody who'd like to ask a question, please use the Q&A button uh, at the bottom of your screen. Um, we're gonna start with one that actually was submitted um, via email and it's it's in two parts um uh, which is kind of interesting so the question is is it true that in the early months of the pandemic there was a noticeable drop in atmospheric carbon because no one was leaving their homes and the second part of that is do you consider that to be positive because it showed that there is something that can be done or is it a negative because it took a global pandemic to prove it <laughs> so um I don't, think, I don't think it was positive or negative. I think it's interesting to see when you, uh, well, I think it's, it's interesting to see that carbon dioxide emissions come down. It's not surprising. Uh, people aren't flying so much. People aren't, um, uh, people aren't using so much uh, energy. They're not getting around in their cars so much. They're not actually even using their offices so much. They're actually all staying home. So there are a number of ways in which, and, and of course, a number of companies had to just Slop, slow down or even effectively stop for a while. The whole economy has been impacted by this. So it's not surprising you see an effect on CO2. The problem is that massive, you know, collapse of the economy that we've seen globally actually didn't have much effect on CO2. It had a relatively small effect on CO2. Uh, and of course, you know, coming out of the pandemic, we know that things are going to be up uh, much higher with a vengeance. People are going to be working like crazy, building, re trying to rebuild their economies, carbon dioxide levels are gonna go even higher than they have been going forward. So I, I think it's, um, you know, I think it's, it's not a positive or a negative. I actually think that it's, um, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a statement. I think it doesn't, I think one of the, the other interesting things is about the pandemic is that it 
demonstrated the, um, the fact that two things. One is governments find it quite hard to deal with this in different ways. They don't actually know what to do all the time. And they, um, they, they, they're trying to get advice, but they've got to bow to the political will and the financial pressures on the economy and all the rest of it. So they don't know quite whether to open and close. The UK has been all over the place on this, going backwards and forwards and opening and closing. Uh, and you see the different responses around the world. If you look back at the flu pandemic 100 years ago, it was exactly the same. And certain places closed down dramatically and fewer lives were lost. Other places tried to keep going and they didn't. So the lack of coordinated global action is quite striking in this pandemic. And it's quite striking actually that the same is rather true around climate change. Trying to get people to all um, uh, act in the same way uh, particularly in the in the context of human human response, what people what people think about their uh, their you know their livelihoods. People don't want to see their livelihoods decimated by a pandemic, uh, so or their way of life. Um, so they basically want don't want to wear a mask. They want to carry on you know going out, going to the movies and all the rest of it, eating out. And to, so, despite all the public health warnings and despite the efforts of some people there's a human factor there that you've got to get hearts and minds on board to support what you're trying to do. Otherwise, people will lose their lives. And it's the same a bit with climate change. Nobody wants to lose their jobs. Nobody wants to uh, have more inconvenience by switching from gas to electric cookers. Um, there's, nobody wants to fly less. People like to eat steak, all these kinds of things. So how do you actually deal with those things about our lifestyle that we all like and at the same time, decarbonize the planet. And that, that's where a lot of the political will, uh, you've got to win people's hearts and minds. And in particular, we've got to think about jobs and communities like coal mining districts, they're going to be decimated as a result of closing down um, uh, coal fired power plants, etc. So that's a, that's a big thing. I think Biden's got right, the Biden administration's got right. And I think that's uh, hopefully going to be, do a better job of deep decarbonizing America than we've had in the past. Uh, we have two questions that are um, sort of related to are about more current events. Um, you just referenced actually uh, the news today about the uh, the U.S. proposal to cut emissions of uh, fifty percent below the 20, 2005 levels. Um, the other question: uh, Elon Musk announced today the largest prize in the history of prizes. 100 million for the best carbon removal initiative and the winner must build a prototype that removes a thousand tons of carbon a year what's what's your reaction to that yeah so um uh well i you know i'm a big fan i mean i know elon musk is a controversial figure uh, i think what he's trying to do is really exciting and if you look at the technology he's developing and he has developed i think it's it's spectacular uh, he's a uh, an individual with fantastic vision and I love his vision for space flight just as much as I love his uh, vision for renewables and trying to switch us to electric vehicles. I think that's all brilliant, you know, despite what you might say about other aspects of what he tries to do. I think trying to um, get people to think about some of these major challenges and offer big prizes, I think is a really good thing to do. I, I also think that uh, for some of these technologies, um, there is a um, there is a really there is a ton of money to be made anyway. Uh, the technology is going to be so important and valuable going forward um, that we're going to actually be able to think about uh, how can you actually build businesses that are going to work on the back of these. So I think there are big opportunities for entrepreneurs, uh, regardless of a gift from Elon Musk, to build uh, the technologies for the future. That are going to make a massive difference. Today, we tend to think about, you know, the oil and the big oil states like the Middle in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, for example. And we think about uh, the monopoly they have. Well, they don't have a monopoly, but the the strength they've had in terms of geopolitical power uh, as a result of being in charge of so much energy. In the future, other states may have geopolitical power because they have great leverage with respect to renewables. Um, so you might ask where, you know, the lithium for lithium ion batteries comes from. Well, it comes from South America. And so some of those countries might actually become much more uh, powerful going forward. 
and they can actually, to some extent, dominate the landscape. So it's not just the, um, the individual entrepreneurs, it's actually governments should be thinking about how can they really capitalize on this. And I know that sounds like a sad way to uh, think about a global crisis and people's health, but frankly, the economy tends to drive and the economic opportunity tends to drive a lot of what really uh, changes society these days. And so I think we should, we should look at those incentives and think about what can we do to facilitate more change through those. Uh, there's a, follow, a brief follow-up uh, to the announcement about the uh, Biden's goal today. Do you think that it's realistic to reduce carbon emissions by 2030 as he's outlined? Uh, well, <laughs> so uh, the, um, of course, I'm wildly optimistic. You've got to be optimistic and, and uh, there are ways to do it. So there's a part of me, depending on who you talk to, it's actually really almost like, um, how do you want to spin this? You could probably decarbonize, you know, 50% of our energy and our carbon dioxide emissions relatively easily. It wouldn't kill us to switch to induction heated cookers, for example, and, and then have so we got cheap solar, we've got cheap wind, we've got to set up the infrastructure to make that happen. We're building more effective longer-term battery storage now. We're starting to use, figure out how to harness hydroelectric better. Um, you know, there are a variety of ways in which we can think about how to switch to renewables. Some of those um, switches may involve some changes to the landscape. We're going to see a lot more wind farms, a lot more solar panels, um, big um, new infrastructure involved in getting the electricity across the grid. So, but we can do it relatively easily. But then you think, well, actually, to get beyond the 50% that we need to do, to actually much uh, to, to get to carbon neutral, You've actually got to think about how do you decarbonize agriculture? How do you decarbonize um, fl flights? And, and uh, you know, Boeing has said it's going to come up with a way to do it, which is quite remarkable. But, you know, people are interested to see how that's really going to work. How are you going to decarbonize shipping? Uh, how are you going to decarbonize manufacturing, uh, you know, steel and cement? These are incredibly... Uh, these produce a ton of carbon dioxide, well, more than a ton of carbon dioxide um, emissions. And so I think the uh, figuring out how you're really going to do this, uh, I think is, um, is, is immensely important. Now there are technologies, there are incentives. I think some of the incentives um, can be particularly effective. The Europeans have come up with a green deal, which is going to be going to include carbon border taxes uh, so carbon taxes at the border, uh, so if you import from abroad, you will be taxed if you haven't got a low carbon footprint on your product that you're making. Uh, so people are going to start thinking in, a, in countries beyond Europe, hey, this is going to affect my business. I need to be thinking about how I do this. So I think there are incentives you can think about that could drive this whole thing quite in quite uh, a dramatic way. Um, but I think the big thing is going to come from regulation, exciting new infrastructure, people actually enjoying living in a cleaner environment and things like that. Uh, I'm not um, uh, confident. Uh, I am optimistic about the possibilities. Very good. Uh, okay, so we're going to, we have time for two more questions. Um, so I'm going to ask, uh, I'll ask them separately though. Um, ha the elephant in the room seems to be population increase and consumption, how is that taken into account? Uh, how, how do you deal with an issue, a sensitive issue like that, in your, your opinion? Yeah. So um, I think you have to, um, of course, um, consider it as a great thing that people can live longer, they can work longer. Uh, and, um, you know, people are, uh, you know, are, are you know, running companies when they're in their 80s and 90s now. And it's actually great that people have that ability. And it's a sign of the fact that they're living healthier lifestyles. Uh, medical um, developments have made a big difference. Um, and so that's a great thing. And of course, lifting people out of poverty to allow them to lead longer lives and uh, enjoy life more, I think is fantastic as well. So the last thing you could possibly think of is that it's a bad thing that people live longer or it's a bad thing that as a result of that, the population goes up. Uh, but that's where most of the population growth is happening. It's from people living longer. It's not from people having more children. 
And so that is the key thing that you need to think about, I guess, is as we lift the world out of poverty, we're going to head towards um, larger numbers of people on the surface of the earth. Uh, there, there are some models that suggest it'll plateau, uh, but um, that is kind of what we got to deal with. And quite apart from climate change, um, we don't have enough food on a planet of the right kind to feed all those people. So the uh, we've got we've got enough food, and we've got too much food of certain kinds. But actually, nutritious food isn't enough. We've got to build new ways of generating nutritious food. So we're doing all this at the same time as the bread baskets of the world are under threat from climate change. And this is, of course, it's not just going to affect areas like the Far East, where people are wondering about how how to build more resilient rice going forward and more nutritious rice going going forward. It's also places like the Southwest US uh, where crops may have been used for feed for livestock, soybeans, et cetera. Um, not just in Southwest United States either, that stuff gets exported to the UK. And so cattle farmers in the UK actually are getting their livestock from their, their feed from elsewhere in the world. So this is an incredibly interconnected problem around food security. So we haven't got just got a problem that relates to climate change and the risks of extreme events. Um, and um, we haven't just got a problem that relates to how do we decarbonize. We've got a huge problem around uh, food security. And I haven't even talked about health issues as well, which is another big issue going forward. So um, we're going to close with this question, which I think uh, is sort of pressing. You mentioned, uh, you talked a little bit about being optimistic um, and hope. So uh, the question is that the, the overall problem seems to be so intimidating. What can the average person do, realistically do, to reduce their carbon impact that is not so intimidating? The first thing you have to do is to vote. I mean, <clears throat> people have to get on board with this, not just as something that is important um, for them, but also important for their children and grandchildren. And what kind of a world do they really want there to be in the future? And of course, you could talk about many other issues to do with biodiversity loss and other ways in which we're trashing the planet. But unless we make this a major political issue where people get to realize that regardless of whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, you believe that it's important for, for humanity to enjoy a decent climate in which to live and a safe environment in which to grow up, um, then if you, you know, that's got to be a massive political issue. And because these things are so long term, they're sort of building up over decades, um, there has been a lack of political mobility on this. But actually, people are starting to see things like massive wildfires uh, on a scale they haven't seen before, a greater increasing frequency of severe storm events, Hurricane Harvey uh, dumping more water than anybody ever seen before in one of those major hurricanes. It, it is a new meteorological phenomenon. The climate is changing and people are becoming aware of it and they need to vote. And that, so that's the most important thing that any individual can do. I would say, you know, I think the other things to think about are clearly things like switching to um, electric vehicles, if you can do that. We need the infrastructure to make that practical. There's no point switching to electrical, electric vehicles if you haven't got a uh, place on the street to charge them up and keep them charged. If you go away for a week and come back and find your battery is dead um, because it wasn't hooked up, um, then what do you do? So there's a lot of infrastructure that's got to be built, but nonetheless, that move to renewables is going to be hugely important. And then I think the last thing to talk about really is we've got to figure out better ways of land use, and that includes an agriculture in particular. So we've got to, because that's a, a big chunk of the issue around carbon emissions that isn't properly dealt with yet which is going to, it's going to be tough, really tough. Uh, but we've got to figure out how to change our land use so that it's actually um, better for the atmosphere, better for biodiversity, and actually better from the point of view of um, food as well. Uh, food that is actually more sustainable and, and actually healthier going forward. All of that needs thinking about quite a lot going forward. So those are the things I would think about, apply pressure in those, on those fronts. Uh Alex, I want to thank you very, very much uh, for your time this evening. Uh, this has been great. Um, I just wanted to remind everybody who's, who's listening in, we uh, are going to send around the recording. 
Um, Alex, if there are any uh, links to the Earth Institute website or any other information you'd like to share, we will include those in the email. Um, we really, really appreciate it. We'd love to have you come back and do the solar system talk. Um, I'd sign up for that one. And we can actually, uh, hopefully sooner rather than later, we can do it at the Bedford Playhouse as opposed to, uh, to the Zoom forum. So th thank you very much again. Um, and anybody who uh, would like to post a question uh, after the fact, um, we will make sure that it gets addressed as best as we can uh, and have a great night. We really appreciate your taking a few minutes out of your busy schedules for us. Thank you very much. Have a good one, everybody. Thanks.